welcome everyone um, to this Humanities Now conversation with Dr. Elizabeth Brake from Philosophy. Um, we really hope that it is a conversation that um, you all will feel um, open and willing to uh, be a part of the conversation and ask questions and answer questions yourself, in fact. Um, I'm Faye Yarbrough from the History Department and also from um, the Dean of Humanities Office. And so this is the second conversation that we've had. Uh, the first was on um, the Black Lives Matter movement in France, so policing um, in France. The next one will be with uh, Dr. Tim Schroeder, and he's going to talk about the ethics of the pandemic. And then in the spring, um, be on the lookout for several more. And the spring uh, speakers tend to be looking at um, medical humanities and thinking about uh, also medicine and protest and bodies and protest as well, right? So without further ado, I would like to turn things over to Dr. Elizabeth Brake. Thank you so much for being willing to do this with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. So this is kind of a preview or window into the big questions course in humanities that I'm teaching. So I research in applied ethics and political and social philosophy. Um, my research isn't really primarily on reparations, but uh, I'm teaching this topic in my class, what is the ethical thing to do? Um, let me just minimize the window. So. When we think about reparations, um, one way we can focus the question is to think about HR 40. Uh, it's the, the number of the bill, HR 40 is a reference to uh, the 40 acres and a mule that were promised but never delivered to formerly enslaved people. And this is a bill um, that has been put forward by Representative John Conyers since 1989 and was finally, um, there was finally a hearing about it last year um, in which the author Ta-Nehisi Coates spoke. And I'll be talking a bit about Coates's article, uh, The Case for Reparations. And what this bill would do would simply authorize a, a commission and earmark about $12 million just to study the effects of slavery and then to make recommendations um, for uh, reparations for slavery. So I wanna talk today about two philosophical ethical arguments for reparations. Um, so the first is to think of reparations as compensating for historical injustice. So these are the more familiar art arguments and they're arguments that Coates draws on in his article, The Case for Reparations. Um, so compensating for slavery, but also the more recent legacy of Jim Crow, redlining, uh, even police brutality. Um, another way we can think about arguing for reparations philosophically is thinking about reparations as the outcome of a hypothetical social contract. So I wanna talk a little bit and primarily about the first uh, kind of argument for reparations. But at the end, I'll talk a little bit about thinking about reparations as the outcome of a hypothetical social contract. Okay, so when we think about reparations, um, one of the touchstones and someone that Coates actually cites at the beginning of his article in The Atlantic, The Case for Reparations, is the philosopher John Locke. Now, Locke himself is actually a controversial and problematic historical figure, um, like many figures in the history of philosophy, because as a younger man, Locke actually owned shares in slave trading companies and drafted uh, the Constitution of the Carolinas, which permitted slavery. But according to um, some historians, over his life, his views evolved. And in the second treatise of government, he argues, which is his uh, classic work on political authority, natural rights, the natural law. In the second treatise of government, Locke argues that slavery is wrong, that it's an injustice. So Locke is famous for the social contract view, the idea that government is based on mutual agreement, that human beings are born free and equal, and so we consent to government, we consent to be governed um, in order to avoid the kind of anarchy and chaos of the state of nature, but government should always be limited by our natural rights. Um, so historically, his ideas had a great deal of influence on the leaders of the American Revolution, the idea that we had a right to revolt. Um, but what's crucial um, in thinking about the case for reparations is Locke's view that we have natural rights, 
uh, pre-existing the social contract, we have natural rights based on the natural law um, to life, liberty, and property. And on Locke's view, when a crime is committed, reparations are owed. So Locke thinks even in the state of nature, even before um, the government is authorized through the social contract, when a crime is injured, um, he who hath received any damage has, besides the right of punishment, to punish the transgressor common to him with other men, a particular right to seek reparation. Right, so Locke's theory, which has been taken up by more contemporary philosophers, implies that when our rights are violated, then compensation is owed, right? This is a, or reparations are owed. This is a matter of justice, um, whether in the state of nature or through the state that's authorized through the social contract. So in thinking about reparations, um, we can think more broadly than just uh, slavery. We can think about the practice of sharecropping or debt peonage in which, um, African-American farmers uh, farmed land without adequate compensation. The way that the economic system uh, was set up meant that it was very difficult for um, the laborers to actually amass capital. Um, Ta-Nehisi Coates in his Atlantic article, The Case for Reparations, um, talks about the theft of land, uh, what he calls a kleptocracy from African-Americans, either through outright coercion or through legal trickery. So for example, pe people being sent notices to pay taxes when they were unable to read. Um, we can think about reparations for past legal uh, discrimination in education, uh, racial segregation, um, laws against interracial marriage. So we can think more broadly than just reparations for slavery to think about reparations for all of these injustices and their continuing effects. So the idea that we should compensate the descendants of people who have been the victims of injustice is pretty intuitive, right? So this, um, there was a movie a few years ago called The Woman in Gold, which is about um, a woman, Maria Altman, whose uh, family was a Jewish family in Vienna and she remembered as a child, her aunt had this beautiful portrait by the artist Klempt, um, a, a very famous artist. You're probably familiar with his um, picture, The Kiss. The Nazis stole this painting. Um, her family um, mostly died in the Holocaust. She was able to escape to the United States. And she fought the government of Vienna, uh, government of Austria, which had placed this painting in a museum um, for its return. So intuitively, this seems ethically right. So the painting was stolen from her family. She was the sole surviving member of the family. It would have gone to her through normal inheritance. Um, and so even though the government of Austria fought it, um, it seems intuitively right that she uh, be compensated by the return of the painting, right? So something was taken making her right involved returning it. But as Coates says in his article, when we broach the topics of reparations today, a barrage of questions inevitably follows. Who will be paid? How much will they be paid? Who will pay? Right. So it becomes a little more complicated than the case of Maria Altman, um, because there's, uh, in many cases, not uh, such an easily identifiable victim or an easily identifiable um, thing that has been taken such as the painting. Um, and so many people raise questions about the complications of reparations for slavery, um, which occurred in the 19th century. So who then is to be compensated? Okay, so philosophically, um, if we think about reparations, um, they require, um, just conceptually, <laughs> reparations requires um, us to be able to identify four different things. So what is the injustice, right? What was the transgression? So storm damage, acts of God, Branham acts wouldn't count. There needs to be a transgressor, right? Someone who carried out the injustice and thus is responsible or morally accountable for repaying, for paying the reparations. There has to be an identifiable victim, right? So Maria Altman um, in the case of the painting and there has to be appropriate compensation, right? So in the case of the painting, return the, the painting, that's easy. How do we answer these questions in the case of slavery, right? So some of the common objections that are raised are, well, the original slave owners are long dead, right? Who's the transgressor? Who, since the people who were the original slave owners are dead, um, who owes reparations? Who should pay? 
um, who is owed compensation, who is the victim. And then the argument, there's no appropriate compensation. This is just something that can't be compensated for. And so if we think through these questions, we can see once you start trying to apply the Lockean um, uh, ethical model, right, there are a lot of complications. So who is it that owes the debt? Is it all white people as beneficiaries of white privilege? Is it just white people who benefited from the injustice? So perhaps those whose ancestors um, owned slaves or benefited from sharecropping? Is it the states, right? So the idea that it's the states is interesting because states are continuing entities. So the US government has been around since the 19th century. Um, so if we think of the state as an agent that can be held accountable, um, it seems as if the state is actually um, uh, an appropriate um, uh, uh, person to hold it, or entity to hold accountable uh, for the past injustices? Is it the corporations that participated in slavery or that benefited from practices of slavery? Okay, so those are a lot of um, different alternatives for who we might think owes the debt. Who are the victims? Is it the descendants of enslaved persons, right, which might be hard to identify for various reasons? Is it simply all African Americans? Is all African Americans are affected uh, by white supremacy, um, by uh, continuing practices of racism? And then the further question, what is appropriate compensation for slavery? Okay, so we think about the Lockean model. Again, the answers are actually pretty simple on the Lockean model. The problem is more practical or ep epistemic, right? So it has to do with the barriers to knowledge. Um, to being able to identify this. But in theory, the answers are simple. Who should be paid? Well, the descendants of the enslaved persons, the descendants of victims of injustice. How much should they pay? Well, what was taken from their ancestors should be restored to them. And who is it that should pay? Well, again, there's in fact a continuing agent of injustice, right? The state which authorized and enforced laws regarding slavery and Jim Crow. So a point that Ta-Nehisi Coates made in his congressional testimony about reparations was the state was paying into the 20th century pensions to widows of Civil War soldiers, right? So it remained accountable for its debts, um, even uh, though the people that had, um, it had originally owed the debt to were now deceased. Okay, so let's think for a second about how we measure reparations, right? Because this is one of the thorny questions. So the idea of reparations intuitively is that reparations repair the damage that's done by injustice. So again, returning the stolen payday. The victim might suffer additional losses, right? So if the victim suffers emotional trauma, um, if their vehicle is stolen and then they suffer lost pay due to missing work, if they suffer inconvenience, they have to take an Uber because their bicycle was stolen, um, then reparations would extend to repaying all those losses, right? Making them whole. Um, so as Nozick, who's a contemporary interpreter of Locke, um, defines it, something fully compensates a person for a loss if and only if it makes him no worse off than he would otherwise have been. And so the idea is reparations have been completed when the victim is no worse off than he would otherwise have been. Well, I mean, this is a counterfactual, it's hard to measure, but people have tried to measure this, right? So here's one method. Um, so Coates in his article uh, points out that a Yale law professor argued in the case for black reparations that we can determine a rough price tag for reparations, right? Look at the difference in white and black per capita income, multiply that by the number of African-Americans in the population, and that produces a determinate figure. Right? I mean, we might use different mathematical models. We might look at differences in family wealth, for example. But the thought is, if we want to know how African-Americans um, would have uh, done without um, the background of slavery and uh, Jim Crow, we can look at the differences between whites and blacks as a way to measure that difference and then say that is the figure that is owed for reparations. And Coates also suggests here something that I think is important. Um, so he mentions uh, Charles Ogletree argues for something broader, a program of job training and public works that takes racial justice as its mission, but includes the poor of all races. 
So again, when we think about reparations and the difficulty of uh, identifying um, particular individuals and how much um, they should be compensated on the Lockean model, um, another approach is to think about creating institutions that address racial injustice, that address um, differences in education and income through uh, uh, things such as job training. Right? So it's a broader approach, um, but it would still satisfy this Lockean criterion of making things right, of making it so that people are not worse off as a um, result of the past injustice. And Coates also points out in response um, to the often heard objection to reparations that, well, you know, the people who are the victims are long dead, the people who are the perpetrators are long dead, so um, we can't carry out reparations. Actually, that's not true. In his article, um, Coates focuses on someone named Clyde Ross, um, who is still alive at least a few years ago when the article was written. And Ross um, suffered um, many injustices throughout his lifetime. His children are presumably still alive today. He um, was a victim of uh, the FHA practice of redlining, which made it um, difficult or impossible for African Americans to get the kind of low cost mortgages, which allowed people um, in the mid 20th century to buy homes and thus to begin to build wealth. Uh, he was a victim of essentially um, legal theft of his land, of his family's land in Mississippi in the early 20th century. So he was actually someone still alive at the time when Coates was writing the article who um, was a direct victim, right? So the thought that, well, reparations are ethically impossible because the victims no longer exist um, is simply false. Okay, so I wanted to talk about a few different examples of models of reparations, right? So I mentioned earlier, what about holding corporations responsible, corporations that benefited, right, from practices of slavery or racist practices? Um, so here's a model, Georgetown University, apparently in 1838, sold 272 slaves, and it announced that as a matter of reparations, it will um, give their descendants preferential treatment um, in applications. Now, this might seem inadequate, right? It might seem they need to do more than this. They need to um, provide some sort of financial aid. It also seems to put the onus on the descendants to prove that they're the, the descendants, which might be practically difficult. Um, but it's one way of trying to acknowledge that what they did in the past, what the university did in the past had direct effects on descendants of um, the people that were sold um, who are now alive. And so it can try to target those people that its actions directly affected. Um, when we start thinking about reparations, we also need to think more broadly, right? So another group that we might think about is the Native Americans, um, the way in which the land is expropriate, was expropriated from Native Americans. Um, and some philosophers, again, using the Lockean model, have suggested you know, reparations for Native Americans will extend beyond um, just thinking about um, some sort of financial compensation or job training or educational um, uh, practices actually to the sovereignty of the land. So Karen Nine, a philosophy professor, has argued, in fact, sovereignty over unjustly acquired territory should revert to indigenous peoples um, who had sovereignty over the territory before colonizers arrived. So we need to think more broadly about um, historic injustice and what reparations are owed. So Robert Nozick, as I said, is, um, was a philosopher who um, was influenced by Locke. So he based his account of property rights on Locke. Um, and so on Nozick's view, current title to property is only as legitimate as previous titles. And so Nozick tried to work through these questions, um, thinking about the expropriation of land from Native Americans, the history of forced labor, um, injustice in the United States. And his conclusion was really in order, because these questions become so um, thorny and difficult, there would have to just be a one-time general redistribution of everything to wipe the slate clean of injustice. We wanted to compensate for historic injustice. Okay, so I want to finish by talking 
briefly about another approach. And I think this is approach is interesting to think about because it avoids some of the conceptual problems that arise with the Lockean approach, which is focused on um, specific uh, reparations to determinate individuals for historical injustices. Right? So as I said earlier, Locke um, was a social contract theorist. The social contract has been very influential in the history of political philosophy reemerging in 1971 in John Rawls's theory of justice um, as a method to determine what would be fair principles of justice. So Rawls imagines, um, how do we, how would we choose um, the principles of justice for an ideal society in a way that's fair, right? Because in real life, like if we were to try to choose principles of justice, um, people have different amounts of power. And so they could, you know, try to steer um, the choice of principles in a way that benefited them. So Rawls imagines this device called the veil of ignorance. So he thinks that this would create the conditions for a fair choice situation, a fair contract um, situation for choosing the principles of justice. So what if everyone came together and chose uh, principles of justice from behind a veil of ignorance, behind which we wouldn't know our race, our sex or gender, our wealth, our income, our background, our age, our sexual orientation, anything that might introduce an arbitrary or unfair bias. Okay, so Rawls thinks we can identify um, the principles of justice that would be chosen in such a situation. And those are the fair principles of justice because they would be chosen in a fair initial situation. Well, there's also a strong tradition of criticisms of social contract theory. So philosophy professor Charles Mills, pictured here, is a critic of the social contract tradition, right? In one work, he describes it as a scam, right? So the mainstream contract, he says, gives us a false picture of society. Right? So if we think back to Locke, Locke says everybody is free and equal in the state of nature, and then they come together in a contract. Well, at that time, not everybody was free and equal, right? So women certainly had very limited rights. Most men in Locke's time had very um, limited rights. So we couldn't really say everyone was free and equal. It gives a false picture of society. Um, Mills says that the fact that the contract, including Rawls's kind of ideal theoretical contract behind the veil of ignorance, the fact that it idealizes us as ideally free and equal choosers is actually really problematic because what that suggests is that society is basically consensual um, with social oppression being an anomaly, right? So um, basically society is consensual, but then um, uh, unfortunately there have been these accidental, um, you know, uh, kind of, unusual instances of social oppression. But Mills rejects that, right? So in his book, The Racial Contract, he argues a better model for the way society actually is, is um, a domination contract. And this can be extended to think about gender as well. So Carol Pateman wrote a book called The Sexual Contract, making a parallel case, but thinking about sex as opposed to race. And so he says the domination contract is a better model of society because what the domination contract suggests is that society is basically coercive. Um, so we can think of society as um, in terms of analyzing um, society as a contract of domination of some individuals to dominate other individuals, right? So he's not saying that people actually entered into such a contract um, you know, explicitly, he's saying this is a way to model society. So if we think that this is the correct model of society, then we need to rethink a social contract that would actually be fair. So I wanna end with Mills's suggestion, which is the corrective justice contract. So instead of the Rawlsian contract in which we choose um, the principles for an ideal society and we don't know anything about the real world, right? We're supposed to be kind of detached um, from the real world as we choose these ideal principles. Mills says this is just not an appropriate way to do ethics because our society has a history of um, injustice, racial injustice and other kinds of injustice, which our principles of justice should be addressing. So when we imagine the ideal contract situation, um, facts about racial injustice have to be part of what informed that choice. So here's Mill's suggestion. And I wanna close with this because I think it's interesting because it's an alternative way to justify within philosophical ethics, policies of reparations. 
So Mill says, imagine ourselves behind a veil of ignorance, right? So we don't know, again, our race, our sex, our gender, our sexual orientation, our social class, our income, our wealth, et cetera. We imagine ourselves behind a veil of ignorance, choosing among different principles of justice, mindful of the possibility that when the veil lifts, we will be a person of color in a white supremacist state, say a black woman in Southside Chicago or Native American on the reservation or a Latina in the Southwest. An ideal society with no history of racial or any other kind of injustice is not a choice option, right? And that's what Rawls wanted us to think about is like an ideal society with no injustice. Mill says that's not an option. The question is, given the society in which we find ourselves, what measures of corrective justice, such as reparation, we would want to see put in place to correct for this history of white supremacy? Okay, so I want to close with that idea is an alternative way of thinking about how uh, we could philosophically justify um, policies of uh, reparations for um, the history of racial injustice. Okay, so I'm really looking forward to everybody's questions. Thanks so much, Dr. Brake. Okay. So um, we are, again, hoping that this will be more of a conversation and that folks will chime in with um, questions or comments. Um, so I'll start with something um, that you, so first let me say that the end point with Mills is so interesting to me and that it really, um, I find that a powerful way to think about it. If you ask everyone to say, okay, what would you, what would you think is appropriate um, uh, recompense if you are a person um, who is disadvantaged in this society and it's this society, it's not an ideal society. I think that's a powerful way to reframe it. But one of the things that you touched on, which is a, um, as it, which you said complicates questions about reparations is this question of time. And so I wanted to ask you if you would talk a little bit more about that, because I think that does seem to be something that really um, holds people up when they, when they talk about this idea of reparations. So to give an example, I teach the Civil War. I used to teach at University of Oklahoma. I taught the Civil War class there. And a student brought up the question of reparations on their own. And he brought it up to say, um, well, I wouldn't want the United States to apologize for slavery. I'm not a slaveholder. I didn't do that. So I don't think we should apologize for something now. And so I'm just wondering, again, if you could talk a little bit more about that, the time element and how we can think about it. Um, so that it isn't such a, as I say, for some people, it's, it's a really hard stop of, well, but it's too late. <laughs> so we, we can't do it. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's what I run into with my students too. That, and I think, you know, with the general public, that's a very intuitive thought. Like so much time has passed and we can't um, rectify for things that happened in the long distant past at this point. So. That's why I like the contract approach so much. So, I mean, my own work is really influenced by that kind of hypothetical contract tradition um, because the contract tradition is a way of avoiding those problems um, because it's not, so what the Lockean approach is asking us to do is to compensate for things that happened in the past. What the contract approach is doing is saying, look, this is where we are now, at least as Mills uses it in his kind of non-idealized contract. It's saying, look, this is where we are now. Now imagine you could be any member of the society. What would you think is fair? Um, and so in the contract approach, um, the normativity, right, or the reason why it's ethical um, to re repair damage is not based on this kind of story of trying to compensate for like long gone historic injustice. It's based on what would we um, choose from a fair bargaining position as principles um, to like uh, make um, uh, that we would be willing to live under going forward together. And so that's why I think that's really powerful as a way to like sidestep those questions. But you know, I think for that historical point, I mean, Ta-Nehisi Coates's article is so clear. There's so many people 
still alive today, and their direct descendants who um, were victims of Jim Crow, of redlining, um, we can trace back these uh, effects very, very clearly in many circumstances. And again, that's when we think about the comparison with the Nazis, right, intuitively, the right thing to do is to return the painting to the woman um, from whose family it was stolen. Um, so I think the fact that, you know, th there are much more recent um, harms um, than slavery and that the victims and the transgressors are still living, I think is a really powerful point that Coates makes. And then finally, um, you know, again, I would turn back to that question about um, that point about the state and corporations as continuing entities. So yes, sure, like the slave owners are no longer alive today, but the state um, authorized and enforced slavery, right? It, the state can be held responsible for debts that it incurred long ago. The state can be held responsible for pensions long after the fact. It can be held responsible for agreements that it entered into in the 19th century. Um, so it can also be held morally responsible or accountable for repaying those who were injured through policies of injustice. But yeah, I mean, I do think that question is intuitively understandable because I think people want to say, well, wait, I didn't do this and kind of dissociate themselves. Um, but that's that's not really the point, I think. And that's why it's so important to like point to the state or to corporations um, is continuing entities. Other questions from any of our um, audience members? Well, I have a I have a comment and uh, maybe a question too. Uh, well, thank you very much for the presentation. I find it fascinating. Uh, I have a comment about the Austrian case, mm -hmm. which you know, for me, my impression was that the government uh, restituted that painting in order to avoid the whole discussion about the Austrian involvement in the Holocaust. Right. So. <clears throat> It, it, it looked like as you no know, uh, reparation, but I, I, I'm afraid that it wasn't really. It was a, a more of a tactic to avoid that very discussion. Right. And my my other question uh, has to do with um, uh, uh, the point that that movement, the Ados movement, American descendants of slavery, often make. Mm. about uh, about lineage right and whether such reparation should be made uh, for the neo African Americans that is say <clears throat> descendants of no people who migrated to the US from Africa more recently oh sorry I yeah I didn't catch your second question but with the first question um, yeah, I, I, I like using that example for teaching undergraduates because I think it's very intuitive to students like this was taken, this should be returned. I didn't know I, more, you know, I'm not a historian. I haven't studied the further details of the case, but I would love to, if you have a reference, I would love to know more about it. But I think what that point about the Austrian government is pointing to is kind of the dangers of like kind of tokenizing or like superficial reparations. So like, Something like an apology that doesn't actually that it doesn't meaningfully address um, the effects of historic injustice. Yeah, so I'll definitely add that as a footnote when I when I talk about that case. But the second point you were saying, um, um, the, the the question between uh, 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 could you just restate the second yeah, question? Yeah, the you second asked? question was uh, a question uh, emerging out of the arguments made by this movement called American Descendants of Slavery, mm. in which they uh, argue that if reparations are to be paid, they should be paid you know, to Blacks, right, who descended directly from those who had been enslaved in earlier time and not, uh, not to everyone. So that is, I think they, they seem to me as, um, as uh, somewhat opposed um, to the view of uh, the contract because the contract, mm -hmm. it seemed to me, it, will, it would you know, benefit all sorts of injustices, mm -hmm. right? Well, they seem to be very adamant 
right, in being prepared for that particular uh, grievance. Right, yeah, good. And I think that it, it just explicitly applies the Lockean model, right? So those who are the descendants of those directly affected are those who deserve the compensation. Um, and so other people who are not descended from slaves do not deserve to be the beneficiary of any reparations or compensation. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, again, thinking back to Coates's article, you know, one response there is, well, wait, actually, there's like broader effects um, of injustice through the society, like looking at Jim Crow, even today, looking at police brutality. Um, I mean, it might, you know, I mean, from a kind of philosophical point of view, um, you might think, well, yeah, the descendants of those who were enslaved, like deserve something more. <laughs> But then there should be other policies as reparations for rep, uh, racial injustice, um, you know, including like up to today. Um, and so we might think of like different programs. Um, but I mean, once we get into the practical arena, like this HR 40, like it becomes so complicated to think about how that would be determined. Um, so, I mean, but there might be reasons of political feasibility, which are not the purview of a philosopher for thinking about the kind of broader institutional programs that Coates um, talks about. But yeah, thank, that's a tough question. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? I had one if, if, if no one else. Um, Thank you for the talk. This was um, uh, very interesting, and I, and I like the way that you juxtapose Locke versus uh, Mills, and particularly the, the the social contract. The question I had is, and maybe I am venturing into the political and what is feasible as opposed to what is philosophical, but um, there are the few examples of reparations that we see in the United States, particularly that have been successful, be it Japanese internment or uh, reparations after for sterilization in certain states or um, the Tuskegee experiment. But these always seem to be on a smaller scale. And um, I'm thinking of the big examples of on, on grand national scales or international scales if we're thinking about apartheid, um, if we're thinking with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and then um, thinking about uh, the Holocaust and reparations after that. The success in, in my mind always came with a change in government and a change in that social contract. And that what it appears that we may be arguing toward with that social contract is more of, and, and they're linked, but instead of reparations is actually a third reconstruction, it is a redefining of who defines our citizenry, um, what is our social contract with the state. And that I, I wanted to hear your thoughts on the role that government plays in that, uh, or. Yeah, um, we, or an actual reconstruction, we could call it that as well, after seeing uh, Dr. Dominguez's comment. But um, wanted to hear your thoughts on the, the role of the state and the role in the change in government when uh, that make reparations possible. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so again, I'm not a historian. I mean, just thinking philosophically about Locke, though, I mean, Locke had this influence on um, the leaders of the American Revolution because he thought we have a right to revolt. Like if the state is violating our rights, then um, we have these rights prior to the state. That's why it's so important in Locke's view that we have natural rights, um, you know, because there are alternative views that say, well, no, rights are like the outcome of the contract. But Locke's view is like, we have natural rights in the state of nature. So if the state violates them, we have a right to revolt and overthrow the state because it's it's no longer doing um, what we what we gave our consent for it to do, what we consented uh, on Locke's view, what we consented for the state to do was to respect and uphold and enforce our rights. So once it fails to do that, it's no longer a legitimate state. And I mean, I think that's certainly um, a view philosophically that's very defensible that a state that is um, uh, a perpetrator of injustice is no longer a morally legitimate state. I mean, so I, but I can't comment like historically on whether it's more feasible or whether um, it's, um, whether reparations require a change in government. Um, I mean, I think on the Lockean view, um, uh, 
I mean, that's an interesting thought, you know, holding the state accountable for past injustices on Locke's view. Maybe, maybe it would require um, a change in government. Um, but again, I mean, those are kind of philosophical, kind of theoretical constructs as opposed to like what's politically feasible or most effective. Well, if I, if I may, you know, uh, based on what you were saying, <clears throat> uh, there was a, 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 another scholar you cited earlier. What's his name? Noswick? Oh, Nozick, yeah. Nozick. Wasn't exactly that what he was. Um, it seemed that he was suggesting something like that, that we should you know, change government. So this is what's so interesting. And um, when I teach it in class, I spend a little more time on Nozick because Nozick is one of the he is the best known philosophical defender of libertarianism. And it's all based on this idea that we have these natural property rights. But then Nozick himself says, well, once property rights are violated, there have to be reparations. That's just the Lockean view that he adopts. Mm -hmm. And so then he says, well, actually all of the property holdings that we have in our society are the result of centuries of injustice. Like he was aware of that. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, these questions are so complicated, we would just have to redistribute everything. But yeah, I mean, Nozick also thinks he was a libertarian, so he thought that our government was unjust. And so his book is called Anarchy, State, and Utopia, because he argues for a state that's like just kind of one step away from, from anarchy, from no state. So he but, argues for a minimal state. But redistributing everything, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, isn't that what communism or socialism is about? Well, but that's why it's so interesting, because it's when you take these philosophical ideas that are the foundation for libertarianism, if you take those seriously, they actually require massive redistribution because of the historical injustice. So yeah, that's what's crazy about it, that when you take, um, that Nozick himself, the kind of famous philosophical libertarianist, admitted this, that taking seriously the ideas that we have natural rights and injustices should be compensated for does require a one-time general redistribution of property to kind of wipe the slate clean, um, which sounds exactly like communism. Yeah, so you, you wind up with these kind of bizarre implications once you take philosophical views seriously. But it's kind of important because I think if people, you know, often people are kind of committed to ideas of like natural rights without thinking through what that actually entails. Um, and so that's part of like, what I think is interesting about teaching philosophy is like, well, actually, if you accept this view, then you are logically committed to accepting these other things, which seem um, like initially you might not be prepared to accept or recognize that they're an entailment of your view. Mm -hmm. I have a question about, oh, I mean, if someone else wants to add something, but I have a question about the difference between, as someone who isn't a philosopher, if there's a difference between um, the ethics of individuals and then the ethics of groups, right? So um, do you, in philosophy, is there an understanding of a difference between people's personal ethics versus the ethics of an organization versus the ethics of the state? Because it seems to me that there's also the potential for people on an individual level, maybe even a lot of people on an individual level who say, well, yes, of course that was bad and we should do something to compensate for that. But that doesn't always translate into the group thinking that or that adhering to the ethics of the group or that idea adhering to the ethics of, of the state. And so I'm wondering if in philosophy there's a there's, if you make a distinction between those things or how you talk about um, how ethics applies to different, if there's even a, an idea that it, it can apply differently to the individual versus other kinds of organizations. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for one thing, there's in business ethics, you know, this idea of the corporation as a person and how far should we think of the corporation as a person that can be held accountable. Um, but there's a, a lot of interest today in collective responsibility. So if you think about something like climate change, well, like my little actions are contributing to climate change with, you know, driving my car or whatever. Um, but climate change um, on the scale that we're seeing it with the devastation that it, it's causing, I mean, that's the result of collective actions. It's not the result of like my driving my car. 
And so um, there's a lot of work looking at those kinds of situations where the bad effects, the really terrible bad effects are the result of individuals acting in an uncoordinated manner. And the thought that, yeah, um, so people, you know, philosophers debate um, whether and to what extent we can hold people responsible. But I would say generally there's agreement that, yeah, we have some sort of collective responsibility, which then devolves on the individual. Even though what I'm doing might seem like permissible and harmless, like when everybody is doing that, then it's going to produce bad effects. And it's the same with wearing masks in the pandemic, I think, that, you know, what I do might be really low risk. Um, if I just think about how it involves me, but if everyone acts that way, then it's going to, you know, produce a surge in cases. Yeah, so that concept of collective responsibility is really important in thinking about um, how we hold individuals accountable for actions which individually aren't that harmful um, or very low risk, but collectively just cause disaster. And that's just a key concept in thinking about ethics today. Yeah. Does anyone else want to ask a question? Oh. I have a question for the historian. So I mentioned in the talk, like, you know, I one thing I spent a lot of time with with the students in class is thinking about like these great philosophers like Locke and Kant, they held just abhorrent views. And, you know, how um, should we think about I mean, Kant in particular, but how should we think about moral philosophers who were actually, by the standards of their own time, um, morally very problematic people? And so I read um, some history on Locke himself and what, um, and so I was wondering if historians are kind of familiar with uh, this debate over John Locke as a historical figure and if you have um, if there's like a consensus among among you, I mean, probably none of you might not might work in this area. Um. Well, I, I'm, I'm familiar with historian. I think her name is Holly Brewer. Yes, that's the one I read. Yeah, yeah. who is in uh, the process of, I guess, uh, restoring Locke's image before historians, because previously was that he was associated with you no know, the. <clears throat> uh, writing of the of the uh, South Carolina Constitution uh, and um, and she's uh, in the process of you no know, uh, putting him into a broader context and uh, <clears throat> uh, calling at for, calling historians attention right uh, to some of his writings uh, proposing uh, some of the ideas that you were discussing here right uh, uh, reparations and at one point in his life, he changed his mind about uh, slavery and, and the role of the state in sanctioning and protecting the institution and so on. Yeah, so that's, that's what I know. But you know, I'm a historian of Africa, so I don't, I don't have all the details. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe, maybe Faye and Caleb, I don't know, Miller perhaps, <laughs> or maybe you're too south. In the so if you if you read the fundamental constitutions of Carolina, it makes it quite clear that um, this was going to be a slaveholding state, and um, there is really no qualms about those uh, 1669 um, constitutions. So a, a lot of people forget that he played a role. I mean, he was a secretary at that point, but I think that primary document it it shows itself. Um, let alone that he was a part of um, most of the Lord's proprietors. Um, meetings and and was recording all of those so he he was well aware of what they were doing uh even if he was merely just a paid actor um to write these things so yeah thank you yeah but i think people like Locke bring up the a similar kind of question that's on the on the national mind at the moment right so just that over and over again you have historical figures who um, in one aspect of their life we we laud and are very appreciative of and then in another aspect we don't like at all and how we try to um, rectify or think about those figures right and so you know in in the in the public discourse right now are conversations about founding fathers who were also slaveholders 
or at our own university, you know, that William Marsh Rice also benefited from the practice of slavery, right, from commerce and slavery. So I think Locke presents the same kind of problem that we have just in general as we're looking in the, in the past and seeing figures who might contribute in a really positive way to one part of the development of the country, but then are extremely problematic or despicable or right, you know, in, an, in another facet of their lives. And this attempt to um, try to balance those things and be aware of those things when we're dealing with our students or when we're in terms of the public history that, that, that we're trying to um, disseminate, you know, trying to have an accurate and full picture. So I think he, he presents that same kind of problem that we see in historical figures as well of trying to think about um, how bad, how bad do the, you have to be for us to write, write all of everything else off or how good do you have to be to, to write out the, the bad things that, that you're also doing and how do we address those people? So I think it, it's, he's representative of that, that same problem that we have as historians. Um, well, we're to 1225 almost. So I think we're really to the end of our time unless anybody wants to ask anything else really quickly. Well, I have a bunch of questions but I don't think we'll be able to address them very quickly, I'm afraid. Okay, well, hopefully this could be the beginning of a conversation between you, Dr. Dominguez, and you, Dr. Brake. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I want to thank Dr. Elizabeth Brake for giving us this really interesting uh, presentation on how we can think about the ethics of slave reparations, the, ne the things that people say to avoid thinking about them, and how we can um, get around those ideas and, and think about what just compensation might look like for the practice of slavery in this country. So thank you so much, Dr. Break. We really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for attending. Um, as you. I said, we'll have another one in November on the ethics of the pandemic. You know, look for emails about that. We'd love to see more folks um, at these events. So thanks everyone. I appreciate it.